In the last video, we talked about the geometry of the Lorentz transformation. In this video, we'll derive the actual equations for the Lorentz transformation. Recall in the last video, we used a beam of light to define when two events in space-time are simultaneous. We sent a beam of light to the right, which was then reflected back to its source. We reasoned that the event halfway between sending and receiving the light signal should happen at the same time as the event when the beam of light is reflected. Therefore, the lines of simultaneity in this frame are horizontal. When we applied this logic to the same experiment in a moving reference frame, we found that the lines of simultaneity were diagonal. This led us to a new way of changing reference frames in special relativity, the Lorentz transformation. In the Lorentz transformation, both the time and position axes in the space-time coordinate system are slanted with the time axis aligned with the reference frame's world line, and the position axis aligned with the reference frame's line of simultaneity. So visually, the Lorentz transformation involves changing the coordinate system so that the time axis and position axis bend toward each other, kind of like the blades in a pair of scissors. Now that we know what the transformation looks like, it's time to get the actual Lorentz transformation equations. So to get the equations for the Lorentz transformation, we need to figure out two things. First, we need the slopes of the new time axis and the new position axis according to the old coordinate system. And second, we need to decide how the spacing changes between the units of time and space. This is related to the effects of time dilation and length contraction. Now, to get the slopes of the time and position axes, I'm going to do a discussion about how we measure time on space-time diagrams. This discussion is going to be pretty boring, but at the end of it, you'll see that we get the slopes of these axes for free using something called the beta coefficient. And we'll get the slopes of the axes without having to do any complicated math. Remember that in the last video, we specifically chose units of time and space so that a beam of light with the equation x equals c times t would have a slope of 1, and travel upward at a 45 degree angle. There is something a bit strange about this approach though. The linear equation x equals c times t does not have a slope of 1. In special relativity, because time is on the vertical axis, I'm going to calculate the slope of a line using run over rise. This is the opposite of the normal formula, which is rise over run. If we calculate the slope using run over rise, or position over time, the slope is actually c, instead of 1. There is a way to make this line have a slope of 1, and that's to consider c times t as a single variable, so that we have a ct axis for time, and an x axis for position. Using this interpretation, the equation x equals 1 times ct does have a slope of 1. The run over rise equals x over ct, which is 1. Now, you might find this idea of using the ct axis confusing. After all, the variable t has units of time, and c, the speed of light, has units of speed. So this would mean that the ct axis would have units of distance. So, how can we be measuring time using units of distance? Well actually, well, actually, measuring time using distance units, like meters, is something you're probably used to doing in everyday life. If you're biking to a friend's house and they call to ask you how long until you arrive, you might tell them that you're one kilometer away. Knowing that you're one kilometer away and assuming you're biking at a speed of 200 meters per minute, your friend could probably figure out that it will be five minutes before you arrive. So a distance of one kilometer can help us measure time. One kilometer of time for a cyclist is just the amount of time it takes the cyclist to travel one kilometer, which is five minutes. We can use the same strategy with a beam of light to help us measure time using distance units, like meters. One meter of time is equal to the amount of time it takes a light beam to travel one meter, this means that one meter of time is about 3.33 nanoseconds, since light travels so fast. One light second of time is the amount of time it takes light to travel one light second. So 300 million meters of time is equal to one second. So to measure time with units of distance, all we're doing is measuring the amount of time it takes a light beam to travel that distance. 
so hopefully it's not too confusing that we're measuring time using units of distance. So if we accept this idea of the CT axis, a beam of light with the equation x equals 1 times CT will have a slope of 1. But let's say that scientist Mary Curie is traveling to the right at some slower speed according to the equation x equals VT. Let's say that her speed V is about half the speed of light, or 150 million meters per second. The equation here relates x and t instead of relating x and ct, which is what we have on our spacetime diagram. To fix this, let's rewrite the speed of 150 million meters per second in terms of the speed of light. So we write this as a half of c, half the speed of light. And now our formula relates x and ct as we wanted. This coefficient of 0.5 here is what we call the beta coefficient. The beta coefficient is equal to an object's speed v divided by the speed of light c. So the beta coefficient is just a fraction of the speed of light. Using beta, it's much easier to write out large speeds. Instead of writing out 150 million meters per second, we can just write a beta value of 0.5. Obviously, light has a beta coefficient of 1, since light is described by the equation x equals 1 times ct. Here we can also see a world line with beta equals 1 half, which is half the speed of light. This world line has beta equals 2 over 3, two-thirds the speed of light. And this world line has beta equals 1 over 6, one-sixth the speed of light. So based on our discussion so far, it should be pretty obvious that the slope of the time axis for Marie Curie is just beta, which is the slope of her world line on a space-time diagram where time is measured using the CT axis. But what would the slope of Mary's position axis be? Well, recall from the last video that the angle formed between the time axis and a beam of light is equal to the angle between the position axis and a beam of light. This means that the position axis will have a reciprocal slope compared to the time axis. For example, since Mary's time axis runs one unit of distance for every rise in two units of time, her position axis will be the reciprocal and run two units of position for every one rising unit of time. In this particular case where the time axis has slope one half, her position axis will have a slope of two, which is the reciprocal of one half. In general, when the time axis has a slope of beta, the corresponding position axis will have a slope of 1 over beta. And equivalently, instead of writing x equals 1 over beta times ct, we can also write beta times x equals ct. So why do we care about the slopes of these axes? Well, with the Galilean transformation, all we were doing was changing the angle of the vertical time axis so that it was aligned with the world line given by x equals vt. This meant that, instead of measuring position from the vertical time axis, we measured position from a diagonal time axis. In the new position coordinates, we have to subtract off the distance between the old time axis and the new time axis, which is just v times t. So the new position coordinate x tilde is just equal to the old position coordinate x with the quantity v times t subtracted off. With the Lorentz transformation, we are also tilting the vertical time axis in the same way, so that it aligns with the world line x equals beta times ct. So to get the angle of the new time axis correct, we need to take the new position coordinate x tilde to be just the old position coordinate x with beta times ct subtracted off, where beta times ct represents the gap between the old time axis and the new time axis. And remember, in the Lorentz transformation, we are also tilting the position axis so that it lines up with a line of simultaneity along the line beta times x equals ct. This means that to get the angle of the position axis correct, we take the new time coordinate ct tilde to be the old time coordinate ct with beta times x subtracted off, where beta times x represents the gap between the old position axis and the new position axis. 
Now, it's true that these formulas give us the correct angles for the new time and position axes. However, these formulas are not quite right. We have no guarantee that the spacing of the time and position grid lines after the Lorentz transformation is still equal to the spacing of the grid lines before the Lorentz transformation. In other words, we don't know for sure if the scales of time and space are the same in different reference frames. This is something we sacrifice when we force all inertial frames to agree on the speed of light. The solution to this problem is to multiply our transformation equations by a scaling factor gamma to allow different reference frames to measure time and space at different scales. If gamma equals 1, then the spacing between the grid lines is equal before and after the transformation. If gamma is less than 1, then the grid line spacing is smaller after the transformation. And if gamma is greater than 1, then the grid line spacing is larger after the transformation. We don't know what gamma is, but we do know that time and space will be scaled by the same amount. In order for the speed of light to remain constant after the transformation, a light beam must travel one unit of distance x in one unit of distance ct, so that the light beam has a slope of 1. If we scaled space and time differently, the speed of light would change because it would no longer have a slope of 1 in the new coordinates. So basically, the beta coefficients give us the correct angles of the grid lines, and the gamma coefficient gives us the correct spacing between the grid lines. But now we need to solve for gamma. To solve for gamma, we will need the reverse Lorentz transformation. Recall with the Galilean transformation that changes t and x to t tilde and x tilde, we have this negative v coefficient here which represents the velocity change. To reverse the transformation to change from t tilde and x tilde to t and x, all we need to do is change the sign of v from negative to positive. With the Lorentz transformation, we can use similar logic. To reverse the transform and change from ct tilde and x tilde to ct and x, all we need to do is change the sign of the beta coefficients, which represent velocity, from negative to positive. The scaling factor gamma should be the same in both directions, since we can't choose one reference frame to be special. The only thing that should be allowed to change is the direction of the velocity. Now that we have the forward and reverse Lorentz transformation equations, we can solve for gamma. We multiply x tilde by x, which gives us this formula times this formula. Now, assuming that the speed of light is constant in all reference frames, we know that a beam of light should have the equation x equals ct in one reference frame, and the same beam of light should have the equation x tilde equals ct tilde in the other reference frame. If we sub in x equals ct and x tilde equals ct tilde into the formula, we get this. Now we can factor out ct from this term and factor out ct tilde from this term. We can then cancel out ct from both sides, and also cancel out ct tilde from both sides to get this. If we multiply these expressions out, we get four terms. The positive beta and negative beta cancel out, and we get 1 minus beta squared. If we divide both sides by this term and then take the square root, we get that gamma equals 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus beta squared. We can also replace beta with v over c and write the formula like this. So we have successfully derived the Lorentz transformation equations here, where beta is just the fraction of the speed of light, v over c, and the scaling factor gamma equals 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus beta squared. And if we write things in matrix notation, this is the familiar Galilean matrix, and this is the new Lorentz matrix. If you remember from linear algebra, the determinant of a coordinate change matrix will tell us the change in area of a coordinate grid box after we change coordinates. So to get the change in area from this blue square to this red rhombus, we just need the determinant of the Lorentz matrix. Remember, the determinant of a matrix ABCD equals AD minus BC, 
and that's the change in area that results from the transformation on the space with this matrix. So then the determinant of the Lorentz matrix is gamma times gamma minus negative gamma times beta times negative gamma times beta. This equals gamma squared minus gamma squared times beta squared, or equivalently with gamma squared factored out, gamma squared times one minus beta squared. But remember, gamma is just equal to one divided by the square root of one minus beta squared. So if we plug this in for gamma and square it, we find that the numerator and denominator are both equal to one minus beta squared. So they cancel out and we get that the determinant is equal to one. This proves that there is no change in area between this square and this parallelogram that we get after we apply the Lorentz transformation. Since the determinant of the Lorentz matrix is equal to one, there is no change in area before and after the Lorentz transformation. This basically means that we need to choose the spacing between coordinate grid lines so that the areas of the grid boxes after the Lorentz transformation stays the same. For now, this seems like just a fun geometric fact, but it will become more important later when we talk about the Minkowski metric. So to sum up the Lorentz transformation equations, we get the slope of the new time axis to be beta. And since the time and position axes make equal angles with a beam of light, the slope of the position axis is just the reciprocal one over beta. Next, we choose the scaling factor gamma so that the coordinate grid box area stays the same before and after the Lorentz transformation. Using these two facts, we end up getting the Lorentz transformation equations here. Also, note that if you take the Lorentz transformation equations, replace beta with v over c, and then divide both sides of the time equation by c, you get these modified equations here. This version of the Lorentz transformation equations is more common in high school textbooks. However, for this video series, I'll be using the version of the equations with the ct variable and beta instead. In the next video, we'll talk about how the Lorentz transformations lead to time dilation and length contraction.